scripture reading is just part of a verse. From Hebrews 12, the first verse, just the first part. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. All right, I'm going to go downstairs. Any of you kids want to come with me? Come with me. Now, oh, he's having fun walking down that aisle. <laughs> um, first off, the reason why Pastor Don said that the uh, it's the first part of the verse, and the reason why it says in your bulletin that the scripture reading is Hebrews 12, 1a, is because... Simply put, it's where I'm going to preach off the first part of that verse. And any time that you see an A or a B or a C, after a verse number, when it comes to the Bible, it just means something is, it just means that the, 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 that verse is split off even more. So there's chapters, and then there's verse numbers, and then within each verse number, if you can split apart the sentence into letters, that's what often happens when... You know, a lot of uh, Bible scholars, when they read the Bible and they're talking about one specific word or a phrase that's within a verse, they will do that often. So I wanted to talk about Hebrews 12, 1a, which says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the first of the three parts of that verse. Now, whenever I hear the word witness, I always say it happens every single time. I either think of a Jehovah's Witness... Or, I think of the phrase that we often hear in society from different places, can I get a witness? Right? <laughs> um, I, that, that, that phrase comes to mind so, so often. And usually when people say the words, can I get a witness? They usually mean something to the likes of, can I have someone see what I'm seeing? Can I have someone hear what I'm hearing? Can someone side with what I'm saying? Um, if someone is in a court of law and a judge were to ask, can I get a witness up here? It's, can I get someone up here to testify to what's being said by another person? Can I have someone witness alongside someone else? Can I get someone to agree with me on something? That's usually what is meant when you hear that phrase. And uh, I wanted that to be the basis for what I'm going to talk about today. Because it's actually pretty important because in a very real sense, as Christians, we need to be able to witness about our faith. We, be, we need to testify to what we actually believe. You can't claim that you believe in something and then not be able to talk about it at all if someone were to ask you. You've got to be able to say something about what you claim to believe. So let's talk about that today. So um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this into three points. Um, the third point is going to be our response, because we're supposed to respond to, you know, you know, what do we do about this information? But the first two points today, I want to talk about the words surrounded by witnesses. And the first point I wanted to make is what those witnesses are not witnessing to. And then the second point is what they are witnessing to. It's really simple. And uh, you might think, well, yeah. It's really simple, so don't complicate it, and don't just go into this big, um, you know, this big sermon about one little phrase. Well, the reason why I need to do this is because people will use this verse to uh, make the the claim that we are to, so. Not only are we watched in heaven by people who are up in heaven, but that we talk to them constantly. Uh, my aunt is a Roman Catholic. And, of course, I mean, in a free Methodist church, I'm a Protestant. And uh, we're not going to agree with everything theologically, right? Um, but I've heard Catholics tell me, Catholic friends, or people that I've joined in, with, in Bible studies with, and they will use this verse to support the idea, not only that people are up in heaven witnessing us on earth while we're running the race of faith, but that we can talk to them, that we can pray to them, that we can... You know, all this stuff. And I don't mind so much that uh, there's an idea that there are people in heaven that can see us. But when you, you know, there's been a lot of Protestants in the past who have had a hard time with talking to them. And Catholics and Protestants have fought over this issue. 
So I think it's pretty important because if a Catholic is going to use this verse to support what they're saying, well, let's, let's check that out. Anyways, um, so let's get into it. Let's deal with the first point about what they are not witnessing. So the, the general idea that people get when they read this verse is when it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, they, witnesses, it, 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 let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that entangles us and let's run the race marked out for us. And people usually think, okay, that sounds like an athletic event. And in that athletic event, you have runners in a race. And in that race, you have spectators who are surrounding the runners and they're witnessing what the runners are doing as they're running, right? Um, and that happens in a track and field event. I did that in high school in my senior year. There were fans that came to the stands. Not as many as the football games, but whatever. Uh, track and field is not as uh, you know popular when I was in high school. But you know there were still fans that would come and they would you'd sit around. They would watch. It happens at the Olympics too. You know, tons of fans watching and witnessing too what is happening on the track when the runners are running. And uh, it kind of makes sense when you read it at first glance. But here's the problem with that viewpoint is that this verse is connected to the previous chapter, and in the previous chapter, when it talks about the cloud of witnesses, the question is, what are they witnessing? Now, because we're surrounded by them, the idea is they're watching us. And so the idea then is they're in heaven watching us because they already ran their race, and they died, and now they're with God, and they're kind of watching us. But... If you actually read some of the descriptions of what they are witnessing. Now, keep in mind, when I say witnessing, that can also mean testimony. That's the, the, the English word for that is testimony. So if you have a witness in a court of law, they are testifying to what the, the evidence is they see it, right? They're making a testimony. So the question is, what is the testimony of the people in chapter 11? Because in... In chapter 12, at the very beginning, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by these people. So let's talk about these people for a second. I'm going to give you three. In chapter 11 of Hebrews, in verse 10, when it's referring to Abraham, it says, he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Let's go a few verses later. In verse 14 of chapter 11. It says that this group of people made it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And then it says in verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. And then let me give you one more. Moses, in verse 26, says he considered about abuse suffered for the Christ to be greater uh, wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to the reward. So, you know, it's given different descriptions. Certain people were looking for a homeland, other people were looking for a city built by God, and other people were looking for a reward that would be found in Christ. That's what they were testifying to. At the beginning of chapter 11, it says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't yet see. So what are they envisioning in their heart and in their mind while they're running the race of faith? They're envisioning the end goal. And for some of them, it was a, it was a city built by God. And others, it was some reward found in the Messiah or the Jews. You know, they had different stories. They had kind of a different race. But it's still the same race of faith. That's what they would testify to. So if I were to ask Moses or, or Abraham, if I were to be able to talk to them and say, hey, guys, uh, you know, what's the deal? And they would say, can I get a witness? And I'd say, of what? Of what? They, were, they wouldn't necessarily say, of you running your race in the future. No, they would say, can I get a witness? I would say, of what? And they would say, of what I am sure of and what I hope for, even though I don't yet see it. Now, people will look at that and say, well, Nick, it does say, Though, there's, there's the athletic event, the imagery is there. We're surrounded by these people. They have to be our fans. And if, if they died already, that means they're watching us from heaven. See, I don't argue the idea that they're watching us from heaven. 
But I want to know what they are witnessing when it says that they are witnesses. What are they giving a testimony to? That's really important. And my claim is because if you read chapter 11, you see that they're giving a testimony to what they have faith in. And it's a different expression for each person, but it's the same faith journey of running. And at the end, there's something that they can kind of grapple onto, but they don't yet fully see it. But that's what they're testifying to. To help you understand the point that I'm making is, um, I'm going to relate this to when I ran the turkey trot this past winter. Okay? In the turkey trot... I was getting, when I was ready, getting ready for the race, um, well, it wasn't a race, it was more along, more along the lines of a trot. If it was a race, the people that were dressed up as turkeys probably wouldn't have won. And there were some crazy people out there. So I'm getting ready for this race, and there are people ahead of me, okay? And they're the ones that are, you know, sometimes have either ran this race before, or they were just experienced runners. And there are people behind me. I was in the group of the people that were relatively new to running in general and, and uh, something like this, which was a five mile run, and uh, I, I just had no experience. So I was with the, you know, the, guy, the people back in the back when we were ready. There's about 14,000 people, give or take, at the turkey trot this past winter. So we're all getting ready, and I noticed how many people were surrounding me. Tons. Now, the people that were surrounding me, there were two groups of people. There were the fellow runners, the ones that were running with me, the ones that would run before me and finish before me, and the ones that ran after me and finished after me, or if they were really good, they were, you know, finish before me. And then on the outskirts of it, outside the lines, then there was the spectators and the people that were watching, the loved ones that were looking at their, you know, they either dropped them off and were kind of watching them get ready for the turkey trot, or the ones that were just there because they're having a good time, because it's Thanksgiving morning. So when it says in Hebrews 12, 1a, that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the question is, are they, the, the witnessing that they're doing, are they witnessing to, or are they testifying to what they see while they're in heaven now, or is it a question of them just testifying to what they're racing for while they were in their race a chapter earlier? My argument is because if you look at the chapter, my argument is that if you look in the chapter earlier, you see a group of people who are giving a testimony to what they're running for, a homeland, a city built by God, a reward, the, uh, life after the flood, after the judgment. These people, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the whole group of Old Testament saints are giving a testimony to something and it's what they're looking forward to. They're looking forward to the finish line. That's what they're witnesses of. They're witnesses of the same faith that they expect us to run for also. It's kind of like a relay race. Now, you know, I don't have a problem with the idea of people at the, at the finish line looking at, back at us and saying, oh, I'm witnessing what they're doing. Like, kind of like if they were in heaven witnessing us. But the idea of the text itself kind of forces someone to ask the question, what are they witnessing? What is the testimony they are giving? Is it the testimony of the future runners, or is it the testimony of what they are witnessing to, why they were in the race in the first place? My argument, based upon reading chapter 11, is that their testimony is what they were racing for in the first place. And that's that's because I connect the two chapters. Now, um, that's really important. And the reason is because it's almost as if they're saying, okay, I have a faith. Can I get a witness? I need a witness. And we rise up and we start racing after them and we say, I'm your witness. Amen. I agree with you. This world is hard and it's a big race and I'm going to keep believing in God and I'm going to keep going. And what you're witnessing to, I'm also witnessing to. We are both people. We are both groups of people in different parts of time in history that are giving a testimony to what we are racing for. What we are racing for. So whenever I hear uh, the words, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, when I read chapter 11 and connect the two, all I can see is not so much people in heaven looking down on earth witnessing us running, but more so people who already ran the race witnessing what they were running for in the first place. Now, there are going to be people that would disagree with me on that, 
But I looked into the commentaries, I looked at tons of commentaries, and one of them even said there's no way these people are spectators. But I wouldn't even go that far. The point that I'm making is real simple. They're witnesses of something, and they're testifying to something. What are they testifying to? What they were searching for, what they were running for to begin with. That makes sense. So that's my take on that. But let's move on. What they actually are witnessing to. What is it? Really, what is it? If you have different descriptions of people that are witnessing kind of the same thing, the end goal, the finish line, what really is it? I mean, you got one person, Moses, who has, you know, riches that are in wealth greater than what he found in Egypt, right? And then you have Abraham who's searching for a city built by God. You have a group of people who basically wanted to have a homeland, which was a heavenly homeland. There's different experiences of these people. They're running the same race of faith, but they have a different experience of it. And they're kind of running for something different, though they're going to end up at the same end of it, at the, at the same finish line. So what are they running for? Well, there was a movie that came out lately by the name of uh, Heaven is for Real, I think it's called. And, you know, a lot of Christians love that movie, I hear. I know my mom and her sisters went to see that movie. My mom liked it a lot. Uh, here's the funny thing, though. I, not all of us had that experience that that kid in that movie had. Supposedly, a kid in a coma enters into this, this, this um, you know, is, is conscious enough to be able to talk to Jesus. Now, I never had that experience at all. Not once in my life. I have never been in a coma, and I have never had an experience where I just literally talked to Jesus and had a back and forth conversation with him where I could hear him in my ears and I could talk to him. I never had that experience. But supposedly this kid did. He had a different experience as me. He had a different experience as my mom. I have different experiences than my own mother does. But all of us are running the same race of faith. So really, what is the end goal? What is the finish line? Um, well, some people don't need to even know the bigger picture of what it is. Because if you ask any of us, including that kid, what is heaven like? Every one of us at some point will say, well, I really don't know everything about heaven. Even that kid would say that. I really haven't been there long enough to really get a good grasp on what heaven is like. I believe heaven is real. I have faith, and I'm going to keep journeying on as a Christian in faith. But I really don't know and see the big picture of what's ahead. And sometimes we don't need what's. Uh, we don't need to see the bigger picture. We are given enough faith to just keep going. Let's go back to the turkey trot for a second. When I ran the turkey trot... I was running, and to me, the reason I was running was I wanted to finish. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to finish was because about 1.5, 1.4, 1.5 miles in, my bladder filled up completely, and it was not good. I spent, no lie, I spent over two miles running with a full bladder, and you could tell, because if you were to look at me straddling along with my inexperienced legs, you would see a man, oh, he's got to pee for sure. And there's no doubt, it was uncomfortable. And I didn't, uh, you know, and no store would let me in. They wouldn't. I, I tried to go into the Sunoco gas station, and they wouldn't let me in. They're like, clothes for business. You're not allowed to go to the bathroom. No, you know, I, that was going on. Finally, finally, at about the four-mile mark, there was a hotel that let me in to go to the bathroom, and I did. But it was very uncomfortable. All I wanted to do was finish that race. It wasn't even a race. I just wanted to finish. I was happy once I went to the bathroom. And then even after that, I was happy knowing that I had about a mile left. And there was going to be people that were going to be given. People in need were going to be given charity because of me running in the turkey trot. And that was a great thing. But I, because I had no experience running it, I had no idea what was at the end. Here's what was at the end. When I finished that, when I went past that five mile mark underneath the, the big canopy thing where it, it registers that you're done, there was oranges that were provided for everyone for free who ran. 
And there was free water. And it was my favorite, per, personally, my one of my favorite waters. There are certain waters that I like better than others. But it was, you know, so there's free water and there was a free orange. Okay? Even better, though. And I had no idea that it was, like, I heard that was, there was drinks at the end of the race. Okay? I heard about that. But this is what I didn't hear about. I, all the people that ended were able to go into this convention center into downtown Buffalo, in downtown Buffalo, go up the stairs, and right there in the convention center is thousands of people. And what's going on is more food, more drinks, and even a band playing uh, a song by, you know, they were a cover band. They were playing oldies music, you know, and it was great. It's like, oh my gosh, this is better than I thought. This is great. This is so fun. It's Thanksgiving morning. You know, I was ready for some turkey, but I don't care about the turkey right now. I'm getting this good food right here, and there's a band playing, and it's like 12 p.m. or something like that on, you know, Thanksgiving morning. It was exciting. But I didn't know that that was going to be at the end. And some people don't know what's at the end of their faith journey. But they're given just enough, just enough to keep running. Some people just need water, just to keep going. That's all we need. I'm going to tell you what we do have that we can testify to. If someone were to ask, can I get a witness? And we would say, yes, you can. So what is our testimony? What do we have while we're running the race right now? Well, 1 John 5, verse 13 says this. You may know that you have eternal life, that you have it already. Sometimes it's all we need. We may not be given a vision of talking to Jesus. We may never enter into a coma at all, just like that kid. But we are given just enough to keep running. And guess what? In the end, when we meet up with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, all those Old Testament saints, even though we had kind of a different reason as to why we were running in the first place, we all will end up at the same place. We'll be at the convention center. We'll be at the Father's house. That's how the Bible puts it. And it will be greater than we all thought. It will be much greater. So, what's our response? If someone were to say, you know, what's your witness? What are you giving a testimony to? What are you racing for? Why do you have the faith that you do. Here's what we say. Well, we don't know the bigger picture completely. But we know that we have a change in our heart right now. And we know that that's just enough to keep us going. And we also know that people in the past who ran before us handed on the baton for us to continue the race. Because at the end of chapter 11, it actually says that we, as a group of people who are running now, are kind of, um, kind of completing the task that the Old Testament saints began running for in the first place. They began running for that final reward. And those of us who are in Jesus continue that and have kind of an awesome greater glimpse of what heaven is like in the first place, but still, we're, we're not given the entire picture because we just don't know the entire picture, and sometimes it's, we don't need to know it. We just need to have enough faith to carry on day by day by day, and sometimes it's all God provides, not because he's not willing to provide more, but because it's all we need. Sometimes you don't need more than a meal when you sit down at a table. And sometimes God gives us just enough of what we need to keep living the eternal life that he gave us in the first place. And what's great about this is at, we at some point will be a part of that cloud of witnesses. Because if there are people, if Jesus doesn't come back and we as people are, you know, die off, this whole generation dies off, and there's Christians in the next generation, we will be the next, we will be added to that group of people that ran the race that surrounds the other group of people that will run the race 
later on. And we might be able to see them from heaven. That's a great thing. I wouldn't, yeah, of course, I would love to see some of my family members who are Christians from a heavenly viewpoint. But the beauty of it is this. Chapter 11 and chapter 12 of Hebrew, Hebrews makes it quite sure that we, are, we don't run a race in vain and we run a race that people have ran before us and they handed the baton onto us and we carry along. It's like the Olympic torch. We carry along what we testify to. So when the, so when the people in the future generations, when, when they look back at us, telling them, asking them, can I get a witness? They say, yes, I can. Yes, you can. Here am I. And we look at them and we say, Amen. Amen. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by people who can testify to what they maybe they haven't seen in a vision, but what they see in their heart, because they know that in their heart they already have eternal life right now. And sometimes it's just all we need to keep going on the Let's all pray. Father, thank you for what you gave us by giving us people to look back on who ran the race of faith before us. Also, thank you for the cloud of witnesses in our own personal lives. The people who can testify to Jesus who we personally know, whether they're a family member or a friend, because they're a part of the company too. Thank you that we're not alone while we're running this. We're gathered around by thousands and thousands of people. And we can see that finish line. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name.